Thank you so much. <laughs> talk about the team building process uh, on the Clipper Yachts as a way of introducing you to the types of people that you will meet and the experiences they may have had before they arrive in Fremantle. I had the pleasure of joining, joining the Clipper uh, Round the World race uh, for two legs, one in 2005 and the other in 2007. After an overview of the legs and the teams, I'll talk about the team building process. I'll then mention a few of the iconic Clipper experiences I enjoyed before wrapping up with some comments about what to expect when the Clippers arrive. So leg one, the first leg that I did, consisted of a short leg from Liverpool to Cascais in Portugal and then a crossing of the Atlantic to Salvador in Brazil, about 3,760 nautical miles. Leg three, on the other hand, started from Durban in South Africa and included a dip down into the Southern Ocean before popping up to Fremantle. Uh, and that was about 4,350 nautical miles or about 25 days of sailing. The start of the first leg was from Constitution Dock in Liverpool, pictured here. The team is shown on uh, the lower right and was a typically diverse group. We had a journalist, a real estate agent, a small business owner, property valuer, orthopedic surgeon, financial advisor, school teacher, business manager, pharmacist, environmental engineer, home renovator, bus driver, and geophysicist. That was me. So all these types of people and more will be descending on Fremantle Sailing Club in December. So how does a diverse group of people who have not met one another before actually manage to sail a boat together? Well, I go through the typical human team building process. Every team I have been involved with, whether it be at work, sailing, playing football, or even camping, has gone through the same process. First they meet and start doing things together. This is the forming. Then differences start arising between the different team members, their approach and their personalities. Conflicts arise that must be worked through. Things like, I do it this way because it's the best way, or who left their dirty underwear uh, on the floor, or who left their sea boots in the nav station, and so on. This is the storming part. With good communication uh, and the experiences of having to rely on other team members, however, things begin to improve. Members give other members more space to do the things that are the best way for them, and trust begins to build. This is the norm. Finally, team members feel pride in what they are achieving and start asking, well, how can we do things better? Whether it be sailing, living below, maintaining gear, or everything else that is part of an ocean passage. This is the performing phase, and for me, the most enjoyable. The Clipper organization is all over this, and they coach the professional skippers to help their teams through the various processes to go as smoothly as possible. My first uh, Clipper team consisted of more sailors, uh, this type of personality, a sailor that had always wanted to cross an ocean or sail around the world. They were more performance oriented and desired good results in the race. The second team consisted of more life experience people people who wanted the experience of a lifetime. They were older and therefore more easily able to afford their berth, and they were also more comfort oriented. One of the crew, for example, was a carpenter, and he made so many shelves, racks, and ease of life gizmos, all in wood, that I'm sure we had the heaviest boat in the fleet when we left Durban. Now to some of the iconic clipper experiences that I had the pleasure of enjoying. The first was the Northeast Trades from Portugal. Our spinnaker went up one day and 10 days later, we finally pulled it down, the longest kite run I've ever done. Steady sailing and fairly consistent 15 knot breezes. It was beautiful. Then we had to encounter the ITCZ or the doldrums. 
We were becalmed for two whole days whilst the rest of the fleet bore down on, bore down on us and at a good rate of knots. In one 12 hour period, we actually went backwards 12, two miles. So don't complain when you wait an hour or so between the easterly and the sea breeze. Two days is a long way to wait for breeze. Next was King Neptune's visit to anoint the equator virgins. Here he is with his helper Scruff, and each virgin had to surrender a personal item that was cast into the sea before they drank the most vile potion that could be concocted on a sailing vessel. Clipper realized that team building events like this are important on long ocean passages. We also celebrated a lot of birthdays. Another essential experience is mother watch. Here we go. So whoever you are, you must take your turn to spend the day cleaning and cooking with a member from the opposite watch. I'm not the best cook, so I wasn't looking forward to this, but I soon came to enjoy it. A bonus is that before you start, you get a good night's sleep. Then there are, then there are the spoils of success. Even the life experience crew enjoyed sailing the boat well and getting rewarded. We were the first into salvage door that year and it did feel good. The Durban to Fremantle leg went according to textbooks. We encountered uh, a fair bit of weather in the Southern Ocean and rounding Rottnest in the sunset on the way back to the finish was very sweet. So to summarise on team building, you have the forming, storming, norming and performing and I bet you recognise these, uh, these phases in your own uh, team building, in your own in, uh, teams that you've been uh, members of. People seem to be really interested whoops, in uh, which experience I enjoyed more. To me this is like asking a mother which of her children she loves the most. I enjoyed both experiences for entirely different reasons and I couldn't tell you which was the best. Nevertheless, both teams went through the team building process. So now when the Clipper yachts get to port, what can we expect? Well the first thing is lots and lots of people. Only about 20 to 30 percent of the crew are around the worlders. The rest are so-called leggers. So there is constantly crew coming in and leaving. They possibly bring family and friends with them. It means a lot of people. It means a very crowded club and the chance to fill the coffers. There will be repairing and servicing of vessels, so they'll need coffees, food and beer. As a club, we have to be sure that we don't run out of these things and that we put on enough serving staff to uh, assist uh, the Clipper crew, crews. Hopefully, we'll also uh, sell a heap of merchandise. I mean, uh, the members of my crew bought so much stuff in other ports, it was amazing. Many will want to take trips to local sites, so have your favourite places at the top of your head so that you can advise them if asked. In fact, be prepared to field many different types of questions if you were around the club. There are also corporate responsibilities. Clipper will make one or two yachts available for current sponsors and to entice new sponsors. Uh, I think if the raffle will ensure that some Fremantle Sailing Club people go out on these boats. So there will always be yachts leaving and entering the harbour. I've written Christmas on this slide because that applied to previous years, but the Clippers are going to be leaving uh, Fremantle on the 19th of December uh, this year, bound to Newcastle on the East Coast. So that's all I have. Thanks for your attention. going to wrap it on about my experience when I did the 2017-18 round the world. I was a round the worlder and was lucky enough to meet lots of, as Megan and Nigel have both spoken about, met lots of great people. Uh, still, our WhatsApp group is still going. Uh, the guy that was the 
team manager for the trip around the world, he's still sending out birthday reminders to everyone. Uh, there was 64 of us, so there's a birthday on average every six days. And Clive's been sending them out, well, for the six years since we finished. But anyway, now how did I get involved? A bit, again, it's quite interesting listening to Megan and Nigel uh, on the similarities between what, how I sort of got involved. I, I had hoped to do a certain navigation on Optimus Prime, but I had uh, that used to race here. Uh, I do a survey and navigation, but it was easy for me. I'd retired, or my young bloke was running the show by then, but I really couldn't find enough mates to come with me. So uh, the idea of uh, joining Clipper uh, sort of sprung up. Uh, the cook was happier about that because, as the vegan said, um, it was in, in, in a, uh, an environment with another 11 boats and organize, an organisation that followed us around the world. So that's how I got involved. Uh, Clipper's an interesting animal in that it takes on people that haven't sailed at all. In fact, for my year, or our race, 40% uh, hadn't sailed before. So Clipper's training or the clipper process, what they train, what they teach you, their process, has to look after people in that of, who are in that category. So everything is regimented, uh, almost to the lowest common denominator, but they just set out so many rules and ways of going about things so that we're all on the same page. It got a little interesting for me in that, so, uh, there are three commands. When you're trimming sails, kites, jibs, whatever, there's trim, uh, there's grind, hold, and ease. But I was sort of used to trim, set, and hold. So it got interesting in that you'd say trim, and nothing would happen, and then you think, oh, grind, so then <laughs> things would happen. There goes set. Oh, nothing had happened. Well, well, uh, a halt. Yeah, so um, that was interesting and took a while for me to to come to terms with. But uh, as the previous speakers have said, uh, there's four weeks of training. Uh, Megan had to go to England to do all of hers. Well, by the time I had come around, uh, the first three weeks of training was in Sydney. Uh, so, you know, obviously was easier to get there than head all the way to England. Week four and crew allocation, and I was, uh, well, lucky enough perhaps, uh, asked to do the coxswain course. Clipper uh, did a, ran coxswain courses because that was part of their remit. They had the skipper, and then they were able to run with the Clipper coxswain, and they ran a course and. 20 or 30 people through that course. So we had some extra understanding on how Clipper all worked. So I was I had to go to England for the Clipper course, crew allocation, which is a big day, huge day, uh, where everyone comes into a hall, <coughs> three or four times the size of this room, and, and the skippers all lined up across the front, and you get you find out which boat you were going to sail around the world or do your leg on. Uh, so that was all done with. Uh, I became a coxswain and then we, we also had to sail. Our start was in Liverpool. The boats were in Portsmouth. So there was a four or five day trip to get them to boats to Liverpool. Now, Clipper is all about media. That's what they live on. That's where they get their funding. That's how it all how they get their punters, the sailors. So, on the way to was up there earlier. On the way to uh, Liverpool, they chartered a helicopter that came out, and we all set up in that V formation that was up there earlier on. Um, and it's something that went on and on and on. Everywhere we stopped, the media 
side of things took over and yeah, you either took your photo, had your photo taken dozens of times and I'd done a Sydney to Hobart so they just, uh, every at the end of every leg they, oh is it, is it like the Sydney to Hobart? I said no, 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 we've just been sailing for the first leg, our first leg was 31 days. I said Sydney to Hobart, it's three days, it's a whole different animal. Um, so, first leg was to uh, Liverpool. Now, our skipper, a guy by the name of Roy Taylor, and no relation, he was a very good for, on seamanship, but he really wasn't into racing. So, the first, it was the race to Uruguay was racing, but not as I like, uh, knew it. So, every night, for the first week, every night the kite would come down and get packed away ready for the next morning if we needed it. And then after about a week, he sort of let us put the kite, leave the kite up at night. And oh, it was always the little one. Eventually he let us off the leash and uh, away we went. And we sort of you know, ended up second into Punta del Ash from being 10th or 11th at one stage. Um, the, uh, Nigel sort of touched on this. I was perhaps the most experienced among our crew and ended up helping others improve their skills to the point where they were able to steer under a spinnaker at night. Um, everyone got to steer, so it was a matter of training a lot of them to be able to do that. But when we got to Uruguay, half of them all got off. <laughs> So, there were eight, eight round the worlders. So, you know, another six or eight people got on. We had to start the process again. Uh, so, I wasn't, I hadn't really expected that, but that was fine. Uh, the round the worlders, uh, as Nigel just as mentioned, we became the core. We managed to work better and better as we went on. Around, uh, around the world. So there's always something to do at the stops. So Clipper have really got it sorted. So at the end of every leg you do what they call the deep clean. So you pull everything out. You pull the boat back to the bare bones, clean it out, check all the, the fittings, the whole works. So Clipper are laughing. That's, we pay to look after their boats. And every month or so, they get a once-over. So I'm not sure there's too many boats here in WA that we could say uh, happened, that happened to. The other thing that stops, if you ever uh, tore a kite or, well, destroyed a kite or whatever, uh, most crews did their own repairs because uh, if Clipper had to spend money to fix it for every 500 pounds spent, you lost a point from your uh, point score. So we all effectively did our own kite maintenance. But that for a, a yachty who uh, likes to look after his sails, most of the repairs were done in car parks and the like. So at Uruguay anyway, the kites were virtually brand new. And here we are dragging them across <coughs> concrete to fix them all. So. Uh, yeah, that was a bit hard from a, a yachty's point of view. Uh, so the next week was put at a Cape Town for us. Unfortunately for PPS, PSP, sorry, with the boat I was on, uh, we started and then the next morning, just at, after change of watch, we ran into a whale and ripped a, uh, one of the rudders out. So we had to turn around and head back to Punta. Uh, it took us, took them five or six days to get it fixed, and uh, I had some photos, but neither Harry and I are good enough to be able to make it all work. But uh, it bent the shaft, a four inch stainless steel shaft got bent. Uh, they stripped the blade off, stuck it in a 40 ton press, and blew that up, and then stuck it in a 100 ton press. And got it fixed or straight enough, made a new timber blade and 
bunged her back in the boat and we were away again. So they did a, a really fantastic job. Uh, we had some horror weather. We, so we were five or six days behind and our weather pattern was different to the fleet. So we lost an extra couple of days. Uh, so we were late getting into Cape Town to the point where we were due to head off to Frio two days later. Uh, and to throw a little bit extra into the mix, uh, our skipper, Roy, decided that this racing lark wasn't for him, so he pulled the pin. So we lost our skipper. New, a new one arrived and he had uh, sailed, skippered the previous two races. So uh, in the two days we had in Cape Town, we had to have a, a day out or half a day out in the water with him to everyone to get to know each other. So we didn't spend a lot of time in Cape Town. Uh, Cape Town to Freya was the next, uh, next leg. Again, uh, I think Nigel said everything went according to plan weather-wise. Well, that didn't happen with our lot. The highs at that particular time were a bit further south, so instead of getting into the roaring 40s, we were at the top of the high and banging into Eastleys effectively. Uh, that happened for three or four days, the end of which we had a 40 knots on the nose, till it finally, uh, the highs got a bit further north and we got into the roaring 40s, um, where we then were able to hit quite a lot of the steers, in fact, uh, got up over 20 knots, and a boat that weighs 35 tonne, uh, it's a pretty good result. Uh, after a lot of toing and froing for the last few days, we ended up third, coming third into Frio, and we came in in uh, dusk as well, so coming around right at that time of the day, it's pretty cool. Um, so when we got to Frio, uh, the whole, well, Coming out of Cape Town, we lost a boat. It got uh, too far, too close to the coast and got caught in a, a weed bank and they couldn't get it out. It eventually ended up on the beach in a national park so they couldn't get to it from the land. So then they chopped it up and dragged it out by helicopter. Pieces and pieces in a helicopter. And the other thing that happened was they lost a guy uh, he was a tethered overboard, overboard man and they were talking to him but they just, and sadly they weren't quick enough to get a halyard or whatever onto him and uh, it's probably changed some of the rules regarding tethers, certainly within Clipper and probably elsewhere. Um, he, what this guy had done, he had tethered to a fixed horn cleat and his weight over the rail uh, loaded the clip, not in the fore and aft direction, loaded sideways and eventually bent and came unstuck from the horn cleat and he went overboard. Uh, and before they picked him, or by the time they picked him up, he passed on. Um, so they, that was about halfway between Africa, so they buried him at sea. But what that did was when we got to um, Fremantle, the whole safety aspect had changed. The governing body from England were up to then had been happy with a, uh, a qualified skipper who generally had an a ocean yacht master and then the coxswain, or two in our case, and two coxswains, uh, clipper coxswains, the ones that we, uh, they had trained, that wasn't good enough. Uh, the organising body needed a second qualified person uh, so there was only three of us within the fleet that had yacht master offshore. So uh, those three boats uh, were able to carry on, but the other the remaining eight boats, Clipper had to find within a week or so, with the ten days they were here, uh, another eight uh, qualified people uh, to get the boats to Sydney, and then we had 
uh, and then get them to Hobart. And by the time we got the early beaks, they just about had to sort it out. But there were people coming from all over the world just to fulfil the what became the requirement to continue with the race. Uh, so eventually we got off to Sydney. Uh, it was a race to Sydney and then a bring the part of the Sydney to Hobart and then from Hobart up to Airlie Beach. Uh, I won't bore you, we didn't do so well in those legs, although we had a second to Airlie Beach, which was our best result since Uruguay. So, um, but the trip to Sydney, uh, I think we had a fourth. The Hobart, the Hobart's the tragedy. I mean, I've been in a few Hobarts and so we were leading and then uh, there were three boats out to sea and further north, and so we'd written them off. Wendy Tuck was one of them. We'd written them off, and then by the time we get to Tasman Light, the next morning they were in front of the whole fleet. So they were gone around the outside. But that's what happens when you're heading uh, down the coast of, of Tassie. Uh, coming, oh, when we left Hobart heading to Early Beach, it was interesting as we were coming past Sydney. We got into the East Coast low, I suppose. It might have just been thunderstorms. Um, I happened to be steering at the time. You couldn't see what was going on, but just by watching the instruments, we noticed that the breeze had gone from on the nose to behind us. Um, and this, just the squalls that were coming through were re reasonably fierce. One of the boats this vision, you probably may have seen it in the vision you saw on YouTube, uh, got smacked on its side and stayed there for 20 minutes or so by the, before they could uh, get it back up again. So it was interesting weather. And then the other thing is that for anyone that has sailed over that side, the East Coast Current, we were down to VMGs of two knots uh, as we tacked their way up the coast. So that can be horrible too. Uh, next leg, Early Beach to Sanya in Southern Ocean, and then from Sanya up to Qingdao. Uh, it so we had to motor out to the outside the, the Great Barrier Reef for our start, and then up through Solomon Sea, uh, across the top of Philippines into into Southern China. Uh, we got a few things right there late, that leg and ended up being the first in. Uh, so the Chinese are, are quite incredible when they run the, when they when you do get in. That the welcome was huge, and then we had uh, a couple of nights later, once the fleet was in, we had a presentation night. Again, the show they put on was just amazing. Uh, next leg was from, well, well San is a, it's on southern China and is a, uh, effectively a holiday destination for Chinese and Russian, Russian too, holiday makers, and they uh, are Russians everywhere. Um, and the interesting thing is the middle Chinese uh, that's getting more and more of them, and a lot of them have boats, but not a lot of them would really appear, don't really know how to to use them too well or go too far in them. So on a Sunday they'd go out for an outing and then, but if you looked out, they were all anchored about two miles from the, from the marina. That was about as far as they went. But they had a day on the water and then brought it back that night. So the trip to Qingdao, uh, for our boat, was another disaster. We had a few of them along the way. We were well in front, but we didn't drive across to get on to the fleet's line, coming into the finish, and we ran into a huge hole. We were stuck in it for about 10 hours. Uh, and three of the boats that were, were 50 mile behind us ended up in front of us. And to add insult to injury, whilst we were drifting around, we managed to drift into a, within the two mile uh, limit of land that Clipper had put onto us since they lost the boat in, uh, in South Africa. So we lost another couple of spots. Um, but coming into Jindao through the South China Sea, uh, just amazing. The lights everywhere from the fishing fleet, 
and we had over 600 hits on the AOS. Some of them were, they put AOS on the ends of their nets as well, but there must have been four or 500 fishing boats out there. So how there's still fish in the South China Sea is just beyond me. Uh, the marina we stayed in in Jindao uh, was being worked on whilst we were there. It's, got, it's just, well, we've all seen it on the news, amazing how China can build infrastructure that seemingly doesn't get used. Well, the, where the marina we went to in Qingdao West was a man-made island. It was surrounded by a four or five metre wall and was full of multi-storey buildings, entertainment precincts, and there was no one in it. These huge, and, and the yacht club, they had a yacht club, it was a two or three storey building, all due respect to the Commodore, but their yacht club clubhouse made this place look like a beach shack. It was just ridiculous, <laughs> absolutely ridiculous, but uh, that's, Seems to be the way they do things. Uh, for this particular, this marina was put together for Clipper. Uh, it would, the pontoons went in about two days before we got there. So, uh, interesting. Uh, Jindao to, we went to Seattle, not San Francisco, like uh, Megan talked about. Uh, we had a slow start getting again out through the fishing fleet and we got into some reasonable weather when we got into the Pacific by Japan, but we ran into one of those hurricanes, or whatever we want to call them, as well, on the way to Seattle. Uh, we had 80 knots plus, some even recorded gusts up to 100 knots for about a day and a half. I've got to say, the sea gets pretty big by the time uh, that's all happened. But we, we made it, uh, it, wasn't quite, it wasn't anywhere near the carnage that uh, Megan's race had. Uh, so we all made it through and uh, the finish line, to the point, we, we'd all been through this huge weather and as we came to the finish line, seven of the 11 boats were all inside of each other. Uh, so they really are a well-matched boat. Uh, Seattle to Panama ended up on Great Bitten because they, their second qualified person got cook or whatever and we happened to have two on our boat so I ended up doing a leg with them. Uh, now that's a leg down the west coast of America to, to Panama and because it doesn't quite get to the equator but it gets, I think Panama is about six degrees north. They have four uh, finish lines, or virtual finish lines, and depending on the weather as to where they're going to shut, where to stop the race, I think we're at the second line. And then from there, you pair up and you take it in terms of motoring and being towed. Uh, we had to call into Costa Rica for a fuel top up, and then eventually got to Panama. Uh, we were there for a few, well, a week or so and then went through the Panama Canal, which if you ever get an opportunity to go through there, it's, it's really quite something. You know, how they built that 100 years ago, all the locks 100 years ago, I have no idea, but I mean, it, they lost, apparently there were 20,000 or so people killed while building it, but most of them through mosquito bites, but uh, it's, the engineering that was involved was quite amazing. Ended up back on PSP for the trip to New York. Um, we managed to win that one too. Um, heading into New York, New York is is uh, was a real experience. You know, you walk you go past the Statue of Liberty, and then into the bottom end of Manhattan, where the uh, the new Freedom Towers been built since they lost the Twin Towers. Uh, and, well, New York, New York is New York, um, plenty to do and see. We actually camped on the other side in uh, New Jersey. Uh, and our view was off Manhattan rather than the other way around. 
Uh, from there, we went to Derry in Northern Ireland. Uh, interesting coming into there. One of the guys that had sailed the first couple of legs with us met us. Uh, was camped on a bridge that we had to sail under as we came into Derry. And he was waving and taking photos and what have you. And we were watching and waving back. And the next minute, a cop car rolls up and uh, had a yak with, with our bloke. And we found out later that the cops were just concerned to find out what he was doing because apparently that bridge was a spot of people to jump from when ending it all, and sadly, someone did exactly that a few nights later. But, uh, well, I found it interesting. We went to play golf one day, and we went, we were in Northern Ireland, and we went north and played golf in Ireland. There's a little strip up the west coast that is Ireland, um, so we ended up there playing uh, for a golf day uh, to Derry to Liverpool, which is where we were going to finish. It was made up of two races. Uh, the first one was around Ireland uh, to just uh, finish outside of Liverpool so that we could regroup. And they had a little short sprint race so that we all finished in uh, Liverpool at about the same time because... Uh, there's five six metre tides there and uh, they need us all in together boys to work the locks properly or more efficiently. Uh, I have to agree with Nigel or reinforce what Nigel had to say about building teams. Um, the, around the world, as I said earlier, there were eight of us uh, we still all yak and carry on, um, but the memories of some of the stuff or situations we've been through will always be with us. Uh, I mentioned the birthday notices, Clive's still sending them out. Uh, so the, the things that I took from, from Clipper uh, was the conditions. I, I once, when I before I'd done Clipper, I thought, oh yeah, i do the Southern Ocean, stick me on there at 8 o'clock in the morning on a helicopter and take me off at 12, and uh, I reckon that'd be pretty cool. But uh, in the end, we did the South Atlantic and then the Southern Ocean. Uh, it was cold, like you wouldn't believe, as was the North Atlantic, uh, North Pacific, but uh, yeah, really, really glad I did it. Um, so there'll be some questions a bit later on, I'm sure. Um, but that was my version of Clipper, a clip around the world. Um, but yeah, again, from what Nigel was saying, you will have people from all walks of life, you will have a changeover, they will have spinnakers to repair, they will have stories to tell. Um, the year we came, we called in, it had been, uh, well, uh, it had been to Geraldton and Albany. Um, funds for regions had paid for those, paid, allowed uh, people to visit those places, but then that, fund, that stopped. Uh, so they came here. That was the first time for a while, uh, the one I did. And uh, I've got to say, Commodore's here. Um, they did a, the club did a fantastic job. I mean, I was a member at the time, but the, the staff <laughs> and uh, all the volunteers uh, did a fantastic job. And uh, I'm sure that'll happen again this time around. So um, if you are able to come down and say hello to them, uh, the crew members, I'm sure they'll be happy to to see you and talk to you. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Steve Parkinson. Uh, for anybody I haven't met here, which is a, a few, uh, I'm the rear Commodore Sale here, and so I've been part of a committee that's um, working 
on the uh, Clippers coming this year for the fifth time here, which we're very pleased about. Uh, I've got a few slides here. Uh, thanks to Gordon on the cruising committee, because um, I don't know how to put such things together. But um, I'd like to just let you know what the plans are for them visiting this time, because um, we look forward to interacting with the Clipper sailors and the staff and hearing about some of these stories um, and um, experiences that uh, Trevor has just told us about. Um, so, um, the, the leg from South Africa to Fremantle is called the Roaring Forties Leg for good reason, I think. And um, they will have some good stories uh, of survival to tell us. Um, so there's 11 yachts coming. Um, they call it the arrival window because of the weather conditions, of course. As sailors, we all know you cannot get anywhere uh, at a certain time, uh, not even a certain date. So this is the expected window and that may even change a little bit because it's a long way to get here. Um, the manager uh, for the Clippers event here will be our harbour master, Jason Hands, very capable fellow. So he's um, the head honcho, uh, the starting point for any uh, communications about the Clippers. Um, then we have uh, Colin Enderbury, who's here somewhere. Yes, here he is. He's our head of the volunteers. He's our project manager. Um, so any volunteers not yet on the list, uh, you see Colin, and, and I'm here to assist Colin. Um, so on the map here, we have the plan. Um, those little red marks over there are the 11 clipper yachts. They'll be tied up. Uh, some of them will be um, double berthed, uh, rafted uh, together uh, two in some places, but in the area of the service jetty. Um, and then uh, the sail repairs that Trevor talked about that are needed and these big heavy sails they have, they've got to get all the way across to the dinghy lawn there, spread them out, get their sewing machines out and uh, put them back together again for the next leg. Um, they've got 26 staff uh, coming um, and they'll be in a activity, the activity room uh, office. Uh, so they'll be quite cosy in there, I think. Uh, that's mark number five, the race office. Um, but they've got some other facilities. Number one, that green is the Clipper Village. So they'll have a shaded uh, information sort of stand there. Uh, where people can ask questions, interact with the staff. And they've got um, some of these uh, containers, I think Trevor mentioned as well, workshop containers that are coming. And so some of the guys will be, guys and girls will be in those workshop containers. Um, that red track there is where uh, we and members of the public that come to visit can walk along there inside the works area, because the works area will still be working, of course, uh, uh, along that track to go and uh, visit the uh, Clipper Yachts. Um, so the finish is off the North Mole, and um, we send our volunteer uh, ribs here, um, uh, two ribs, any time of the day or night, uh, our volunteers will go out there to meet uh, the incoming yachts and uh, lead them and help them into the club here. We're sort of actors like tugboats and we'll uh, help nose them up to those berthing areas. We'll have shore-based uh, volunteers with mooring lines that are already set up uh, to hand over to uh, the boats so they can tie up there. Um, they then have to be cleared by uh, uh, Border Force 
and biosecurity. Um, and, and they have working hours, of course, so <laughs> they cannot be cleared any time of the day and night. Um, and we cannot touch them, hand anything to them, uh, or um, take anything from them until they've been cleared from these um, government agencies. So that determines when we can interact with them. So really, um, biosecurity is 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So once they've done their clearing, we can give them a, a sausage uh, in a bun and, and, and a beer, and uh, in true, uh, you know, Australian welcoming uh, form. Um, and uh, our, one of our chief volunteers is indeed our Commodore, Kyle Timms, and his wife, Heather, who will be uh, running a fantastic barbecue. Um, so, um, yeah, like I say, if there's any others that haven't got on the volunteer list yet, please see Colin. Um, so we're looking for some uh, activities, and there, Clipper are looking for some activities where they can interact and get to know us uh, uh, a bit better. And obviously, uh, a twilight is, is something that uh, jumps to mind straight away. So during the time they're here, uh, Wednesday 13th, um, please, especially, there's a good number of cruising people here, uh, but others as well that are twilighting. Uh, keep that in mind, uh, and uh, it'd be great if you're uh, w uh, welcoming to take uh, Clipper sailors or uh, their staff members uh, out on your boat. And um, we'll probably, when it gets closer to the time, we'll get a bit more organised with that through the boating office here. We'll probably set up a, um, a, 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 an online booking type thing. Uh, if you're able to take one or two people on your boat um, to uh, find out who are volunteering that and, and, and put you in uh, contact with people who want to go out for a twi twilight. Um, yeah. Um, another uh, interaction uh, and uh, interest uh, night will be a skipper's talk. So we'll get um, some of the skippers off the boats to come and present to us uh, up here in the wardroom on uh, Friday the 15th um, at 17.30 and uh, um, opportunity to ask them questions about their experiences and I'm sure that'll be really interesting. And um, it's the same day as our club Christmas party which is uh, a bit after that so We'll invite them to all come and join in on our Christmas party here at the club on that day. So that should be a good time uh, uh, with Clippers as well. Um, and they've asked, they said, you know, that coming through the Roaring Forties, they'll have some weary muscles and they'd like some yoga classes to <laughs> limber up. Well, we're so fortunate to have a, a yoga teacher here who's been running classes, uh, some of you may have even uh, joined in on a Saturday morning um, with uh, Hedda Koenig, who's actually here. Uh, Hedda, would you like to stand up, Hedda? Sure. Um, Hi. So, those who haven't met Hedda, um, if you're interested or you'd like to try yoga, um, please see Hedda. Um, we are going to extend this invitation. They've requested this for the staff and the uh, Clipper sailors uh, to, uh, it's another opportunity to get together uh, for a Saturday morning yoga class. Um, are they up here or are they on the lawn down there? We'll be on the lawn. On yeah. the lawn, that'd be nice. So it'd be nice and warm by then and uh, I, um, I'm sure I might even think about it myself. I haven't done any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they have what they call an activation window. So, um, they've got um, Saturday the 16th and 17th, Sunday the 17th, where the major stuff 
happens on those two days. So major activities planned. So on the Saturday, um, there's, um, well, there's a public yacht tours there at those times. And on that Saturday, there's also an opportunity uh, to go for a sail on a clipper boat. Uh, unfortunately, they can only take uh, a dozen people. So um, uh, tonight, we're going to make a draw. So there's two of those lucky people in this room right now. Um, and we're going to do similar draws at different times, like the skipper's talk. There'll be another couple drawn then. Um, so, 10 of those spots will go to club members, uh, including a couple of young dinghy sailors, and uh, a couple of those spots will go to other sailors uh, through Australian sailing here. Uh, so, getting sailors who are interested in uh, what Clipper is doing. So, um, they're also doing, uh, they do a refresher orientation uh, sailing to uh, introduce their new crews uh, as part of their crew changeover and things. Um, on the Sunday, they've asked for a social cricket match. This is apparently something they do uh, in most or all of the ports they come to. Um, they enjoy it, they find it's a good way to interact. So, um, we've, they've asked for that. And we, it's actually going to be on the Sunday afternoon, that's been changed now. Um, but it's, we've got a great opportunity. We've got a, through one of our offshore uh, sailors who's been a member for a long time, he's offering uh, the cr cl cricket club where he is in Fremantle. And he's got all the cricket gear, a good grounds. They've got a, a bar there which will be open. So um, we just need a team, really. <laughs> so we need some sailors that can also play cricket, uh, you know, because we our first eleven uh, we need to get together. Um, so I think uh, if anybody knows how to play cricket or uh, coach or you know be uh, uh, carry the drinks or all that sort of stuff, you know, um, just see Colin and uh, let Colin know and hopefully we can get a team together but also with uh, supporters and uh, cheer squad and everything you know um, in the af no no uh, sorry so that's in the afternoon so in the morning uh, they've also asked for a sustainability activity uh, so like a lot of these world sailing events I think you know they're very keen on um, the environment, of course, because you know they're spending so much time out in the marine environment, and they want to look after the environment and be seen to looking after the environment. So they've asked what they can do. So um, uh, Anita Wint here, who's our uh, head of our marine environment committee here uh, for the last few years and won awards for that activity. As they've organised a, a beach clean-up on South Beach, the, uh, the one just beyond the uh, dog beach there. It's going to, in the morning, there's going to be uh, a beach clean-up um, with the Clipper uh, crews, uh, volunteers. And so anybody who's interested in that, uh, just please come and join in and there'll be a sausage sizzle social afterwards. Anita, you got something to add? Fantastic. So that's bound to be another good, worthwhile, uh, but also a social event. This. Sorry, just want to mention as well with um, Heather's help, we've actually got uh, lined up to have some players from the All Ability Cricket team coming to give us a hand with the beach clean up and the, uh, and the beach cricket. Right. So again, if you, if you like it for fun, but you don't consider yourself a candidate for Commodores, then it's a little That's fantastic. Thanks, 
uh, Anita for that. Um, you might recognise that this fellow over here on the right is Sir Robin Knox Johnson. Um, he's 84 years old now, but so um, looking around the room, um, if you keep sailing like this guy, this is what you're going to end up looking like, you know. Um, he was, of course, the first person to sail race in the Golden Globe race uh, in 1969 around the world and won that race. And then later on, he, uh, he, he started the Clipper organisation and is chairman of the Clipper organisation. And um, we don't have confirmation uh, that he will uh, make an appearance here, um, but uh, we've been told that uh, we, um, we've seen him here before and he likes to pop in, uh, so keep an eye out for him. Um, so then, lastly, of course, they restart uh, because they're going around the bite uh, up to Newcastle, is uh, around the bottom of Tasmania there, that's their next leg. Um, and it's on Tuesday the 19th of December. They like to leave apparently um, on a weekday really, so it's not too busy a time. Uh, so put that date in your diary and if you're lucky enough to be retired or have time off, um, we'd love to see you get your boat out there and, and uh, maybe even take any people that don't have a boat that want to get out there and see the start, be part of the flotilla. Um, because they do these things, they do, they have a bit of a parade around sailing. Uh, they have a man overboard drill uh, before they start each leg apparently. Um, and uh, success will be out there uh, for a start at uh, 1500. So anyway, there's lots going on and it will develop. We have to keep an eye on the website and the information will come out. Um, so have a good time with the Clippers while they're here, I hope, and just ask questions here at the club, reception, etc. Uh, if you're looking for information and uh, we look forward to a good time with them. Um, thanks, Ariane. Oh, draw, yes, absolutely. Let's see who's going to go Clipper sailing.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.